This is KC Sports Network, proudly presented by M Prize Bank. All right, folks, what's good? Uh, a little different episode of Ain't No Seats for you today. We've got B Turn with travel issues. I think his flight's delayed or something. He wasn't able to. We've been trying to record all week, haven't been able to make it happen. AB's on the way back from Colorado, not going to be back till later tonight. So I had to get our man Nick Springer here, who has been behind the scenes with us for like, gosh, I don't even know, a few months. But he talks about the yeah. Hawks for a living. Uh, he does it every day, so I figured no better person to bring on board today with me um, than him. So, Nick, how's it going? Man, it's going great. Yeah, uh, I'm happy to be here, happy to be on the show. Uh, as you said, I've been kind of behind the scenes, so uh, I'm glad to be in front of the camera now and uh, talking, uh, talking some shop with you. Yeah, if you've ever noticed us like reference a Nick or a chat, or at some point it's because Nick throws in just hilarious comments in the chat that we never you know our listeners have no idea is happening so uh it's 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 always good stuff so it'll be interesting to see if he brings that uh, same energy today but why we had to get on here and record is obviously big game coming up on saturday kuou uh big noon i would big noon game day is that what it's called big noon kickoff they big kick off, kick off officially. I don't know. The name just doesn't flow quite like game day, but yeah, they're in Lawrence. That's exciting stuff. I mean, it, it's still, even though we had game day last year, it's to me just awesome that KU was able to lose a game and then their next game, they're able to host something like that. So it shows that the, the entire country is very bought in on this new era of Kansas football. Um, but I guess where I want to start with, Nick, is we have OU coming to town. We There were rumors that Jalen may come back this weekend. Does not seem to be the case. Seems to be pretty clear Jason Bean is, is going to be the starter. I guess let's just start with that conversation. Do you feel like this could be the last week we see Jason Bean? Like, could this be his final, assuming no more injuries, could this be his final game where he starts for Kansas? Uh, no, I feel like he's probably going to start more games after this. Actually, um, with the Jalen Daniels saga—it's—it's there. It's certainly been a saga at this point, right? I mean, every week you get Lance Leipold getting out there saying, "I mean, this week I thought it was ridiculous." He gets out there and, in the same sentence, he says he's optimistic about Jalen, but that Jalen is also doubtful. I don't really know how those two go together. So, uh, you know, he's playing gamesmanship or whatever. So, it's—it's it's certainly been a saga. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think with with Jalen with Jason Bean, you can certainly still go out and, and win football games. You can certainly go out and still win against Oklahoma. And I, I expect Jason Bean will probably start another game down the road. I don't know which one. Because the thing with Jalen is like the back injury, it's obviously more significant than back tightness, which is what it was kind of diagnosed as originally. Uh, and it's something that I think clearly is more of a day-to-day issue where some days you see he might be fine, other days he might have issues with it, uh, which obviously... From the outside perspective, I'm sure it was very frustrating from the fan base, but I'm sure it's equally frustrating internally for KU because Andy Kolnick, he always talks about wanting to design the offense that's the most stressful offense to face in the country. And a lot of that has to do with game planning throughout the whole week. And you can't really institute a high quality game plan or a game plan that's going to stress a defense very much if you don't know which quarterback you're going to go with. So I think probably the decision was made pretty early this week that Jason B was going to be the guy because I think KU realized what happened in the Texas game where if you game plan one way and you have to start a different guy, bad things are going to happen. Yeah, and so it it's just so I was I was talking to someone today and it's so hard to describe Jason Bean because Jason Bean against Oklahoma State for really, I mean what, almost 3 quarters, I mean for sure a first half. Uh Yeah. Well, I mean, you see that guy play, he looks like one of the best quarterbacks in the country. Like, he has the ability here. There is no doubt if Jason Bean brings his A game on Saturday that KU can beat Oklahoma without Jalen Daniels. But what scares me and has always scared me about Jason Bean is if this is a close game, if this is a game that comes down to the wire, um, and I don't know, you may know, I think OU's got a pretty solid defense, don't they? They are much improved, yes. Yeah. Much improved from last year. So I don't know. I mean, do we feel the Hawks can win this game with Jason Bean at quarterback? And what type of performance would do you think it would take from Bean to get that done? 
Yeah, the, the funny thing about this conversation is uh, the more I thought about it, the more I kind of realized like whether it's Jason Bean or Jalen Daniels, you would need the quarterback to play well. So regardless of who was going to be starting at quarterback, you would need uh, uh, to, them to play well. Uh, I think the big difference here with between Jason Bean and Jalen Daniels in a game like this, specifically what you kind of touched on is Jalen Daniels has shown that he has that sort of X factor. He has that sort of late in the game, you need a big play, you need a big drive, he can get it done. Jason Bean just he just it's just not quite the same. He just doesn't quite have that, you know. Uh, Jason Bean at his at his best can be as good as Jalen Daniels, I think, especially in the KU offense. But it's the valleys where you know he makes the, some mistakes with interceptions, and it's just kind of the lack of maybe that real killer instinct, so to speak, of knowing that all right, the game is on the line here, or knowing that hey, you know, we need to go out and go execute on this drive, and can Jason Bean do that? That's the part that I think concerns me the most. And like you said, you know. If this is like a, if it's like, if KU's down by, you know, four points in the fourth quarter with the ball and you need Jason Bean to go out on the field, that's where I start to get nervous, right? With Jalen Daniels, you feel pretty confident because he's shown that he has that sort of ability late in games to turn on that X factor mode and then make a big play. Whereas with Jason Bean, it's just not quite there. It's not quite there. But the the beauty of it is, you know, like I said, Jason Bean at his best, I think is as good as Jalen Daniels in the KU offense. I mean, he was outstanding, obviously. Uh, against Oklahoma State in the first half. So uh, he'll need to play well, certainly, for KU to win. And what's most frustrating to me is a lot of Jason Bean's best performances as a Jayhawk have coincided with the defense having really bad games or other bad things happening around KU. I mean, Oklahoma the Oklahoma State game was the defense's worst game of the season, I think, besides yeah. maybe Nevada, I guess. But um, And then you look at the special teams, who had, which had been really great the whole season, and they can't make an extra point. It's, yeah. it's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's kind of my big thing is like it, J- Jason Bean will have to play well for for KU to win, but he's going to need uh, the other parts of KU to also play well. Whereas I think Jalen Daniels on his own possibly could will you to win, kind of carry the team to a win. I don't think Jason Bean has that same ability. He's going to need some de- some plays from the defense. He's going to need some, some things to go right in other areas as well for KU to have a chance to, to beat Oklahoma. Yeah, that that's well said. That's a good point. Um, now, on the other side of it, we're looking at cold weather. We're looking bad weather. Maybe a little rain. Maybe I've heard rumblings of snow. Is there any point, or is there any chance that this just becomes a running game, our running game against their running game? And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we are the better running team. And yes. maybe by a significant, I don't know how significant we are, but I think we're better. Yeah. I mean, Oklahoma, I believe, is ninth in the Big 12 in rushing. So bottom five, whereas KU is obviously in the top uh, of the Big 12 with their rushing ability. So, yeah, I, I'd be curious to see how, how the weather plays a factor in as well, because I think that that definitely favors Kansas. And one of the areas of Oklahoma that I think has maybe gone underlooked a little bit is their offensive line has not been really elite in either pass blocking or run blocking this season. And so this could be a game where if it comes down to the trenches, KU may be able to create an advantage on the defensive side. Austin Booker seems to be fully healthy after he was dealing with who knows what against Oklahoma State. Jamie Robinson's back. Hayden Hatcher's been practicing more. So I think there's a real possibility that KU's defensive line could have a better game here against Oklahoma and could be more disruptive. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the last thing you want to do is, is let Dylan, Dylan Gabriel just sling it around. So... That, that's going to be an issue. Oklahoma has a lot of weapons, and KU is going to have to find a way to manage that. And You know, this isn't the Oklahoma offensive pass. They don't have a Marvin Mims. They don't have, you know, a top high-end receiver. But they do have a lot of really, really quality receivers. And so that could pose an interesting challenge for KU's defense because if, he, if they have one really, really talented guy, you'd say, all right, Kobe Bryant, you know, go do your thing. And then maybe you can help out in other areas. But because they've got a group of guys that are really talented, I think that's going to pose an interesting challenge for the KU defense. And Maybe the weather can help them out a little bit and then make things more difficult for, for OU passing, but uh, I, I think OU is going to be able to move the ball successfully. And the other big aspect of it is obviously Oklahoma's tempo. Uh, OKU has shown in the past that they have struggled against tempo. There was a lot of talk about tempo all week long from the coordinators, from the players as well for KU. So it's certainly something they've been focusing on, and maybe the bye week has helped them a little bit in preparation for that. But uh, if Oklahoma gets their tempo really rolling, KU's defense could be in trouble. Yeah, it that's the thing that has got me weirdly. I mean, I always talk myself into a science by Thursday. It's like, OK, we could do this. We could do this. But like the bye week aspect, the 
the fact that that Oklahoma State loss was just, I mean, that's probably one of the more painful losses of the Leipold era just for that staff and a lot of these guys. So it's like, was that maybe a almost a refocusing moment? Not that, I mean, I guess you could say they kind of lost their focus in that second half against Oklahoma State, or at least, like you said, defense was poor and offense just kind of went away late in the game. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I feel like, do we have any numbers on like what Lance has done after bye weeks? Probably not great numbers because obviously his first couple years we we still weren't winning tons of games. But I just I trust the staff uh, with a bye week with OU coming up and like you said OU and I don't know if this is me just being wildly disrespectful. Um, they don't have guys that just scare me like they have in the past that you just like there is no way we can stop. Stop these. I mean, let's look at their offense. No, no Eric Gray, no Marvin Mims. Their yeah. defense doesn't really have any huge names that like really jump off the page at you. So I agree. I mean, even though they're seven and zero, they beat Texas. They're probably feeling like they're oh, we're Oklahoma, we're on top of the world. I think they're very beatable, actually. Yeah. Very beatable. I do too. Uh, let's we'll talk more about OU. Let's hit our first break. We're going to talk about home field here. We talk about them every time. I think you're repping them as we speak. Homefieldapparel.com. They're the goats. Uh, just look at his shirt, folks. If you're watching on YouTube, the, this this cursive font, it's yeah. just incredible. I think back to the old school, not even old school, but like the I think they debuted those the Wiggins year. Phenomenal jerseys with that script on like the cream color jerseys and home. That's what Home Field does. They take awesome concepts that KU has rolled out or other schools have rolled out, and they just create merch that the fans get to wear, which is something you just don't see from really any other uh, college apparel companies out there. So go support Home Field Apparel if you have not already. Uh, you can find them at homefieldapparel.com. We love all their stuff. Their hoodies, it is officially hoodie season, and their hoodies are fantastic, incredibly soft. So go check them out. We we love how they look, but also how they feel. So shout out Home Field, um, and we'll be right back after a quick break. Thanks for listening to KC Sports Network. Make sure you download our new app. Find it on the App Store or Google Play. Just search KC Sports Network. Okay, so you mentioned OU. They're seven and zero. What are they ranked? They are number six. Number six. Six. And Wait, hey, that's the last undefeated team. So there's five undefeated teams in front of them, and then I think. Texas is seven, actually. So I think uh, the, they're the last undefeated team, the lowest ranked undefeated team, I guess. I'll be honest, and I don't know if I'm just a homer, but nine and a half, that's the line. It's seen, I, I don't know. Am I crazy for thinking that seems high? I guess if I think that I should just hammer the Hawks. But I was a little shocked. I expected more like a touchdown. I thought nine and a half was a bit disrespectful. I mean, what do you... What do you think that says? Is that more about how good OU is, or did KU losing to Oklahoma State kind of, uh, I don't know, lower us in the terms of how everyone else views us? Yeah, I, I thought it would be a little bit. The line would be a little bit more favorable to Kansas as well. To be honest, uh, when you look at the numbers, KU at home versus on the road, they've been phenomenal at home. I mean, they're holding opponents to twenty-two points per game at home. They're scoring over forty points a game at home. They've been great at home. Like the booth has actually been really good for KU uh, this season, which is great that it that it sold out. By the way, so hopefully yeah. KU fans can can get active there. Uh, but yeah, no, I I thought it was a little bit higher than I was expecting. Uh, you know, Oklahoma's coming off of uh, kind of a, a snoozer of a game against UCF where they almost lost. They maybe should have lost. There was a bad PI call late in the game. I think that that kind of bailed them out. Uh, and obviously KU demolished UCF, right? So. Yeah, that makes you feel pretty good about that. I don't know how much that was maybe a hangover game for, for Oklahoma after the Texas win, but I would expect them to come to Lawrence more locked in. And, you know, the other thing is, is this is not KU teams of the past where teams would probably just roll in and be like, oh, it's Kansas, whatever. Like, you know, I'm sure teams are now saying, okay, we got to go to Lawrence and we got to be ready to play. So you're not going to, you're going to, you're not going to get Oklahoma kind of sleeping a little bit in this game. They're going to be coming in ready to win. And obviously, from Oklahoma's perspective, they're thinking they're dreaming about the college football playoff now, right? I mean, they after this game against KU, their next toughest game on their schedule is at Oklahoma State, and they're going to have a pretty good chance to maybe go undefeated and put themselves in the virtual title game. And 
Kansas has a chance to spoil all that, obviously, right? And if KU wins, you can maybe put them right back in the in the Big 12 title race conversation potentially as well. Yeah, and I mean, on the topic of like OU not showing up a s- half asleep, like it's big noon, big noon, what is it called? Big noon, <laughs> noon kickoff. Big noon kickoff. Why do I keep funny? <laughs> I'm merging game day and big noon. Big noon game day and big noon kickoff. <laughs> Whatever, big noon. If I mean, it's it's a a game that's now being talked about in the national media, like you're going to get OU uh, for what OU is, I think. I don't think you're going to get the OU that slept walk against UCF. So it's absolutely going to take uh, KU's A game. But I wanted to talk about this because, the, like I said, the Oklahoma State loss was truly, it hurt. It was just a game. Oh, it was terrible. KU gave that game away. You could tell Lance was mad. I mean, Lance was furious. You could just... It just felt like a, a loss that could spiral a season a little bit. Now, to me, it feels like a game we definitely let slip away that we should have won. Do you feel like this team has to, I mean, obviously they got to go win a few more games for this to be really looked at as a special year. But like, do you feel like if we don't go, I won't even say win, but if we don't come out and put up a really impressive, good performance against OU, do you think it's possible you could start to see the wind? I, I don't know. The, the team starts yeah. just with the Jalen stuff and then losing the Oklahoma State game. And then if you lose on, on this stage, I guess, kind of, I don't know. I'm just getting a little worried, but it's because it's oh, I get it. I get trauma it. that we've all been through. No, I know. People, you know, KU loses one game and all of a sudden people think, oh, God, they're not going to win another game the rest of the season. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, it's it's tough. And, KU has some very winnable games coming up after the Oklahoma game. So I think as assuming KU doesn't just get absolutely blasted, which I don't think they will, uh, my opinion probably won't change that much going forward the rest of the season. And I thought Lance Leipold had a really interesting quote uh, back when KU was 4-0. And he, he basically said that it was possible for this iteration of KU football to be better than last year's team, but have maybe the same record. Yeah, uh, basically due to you know tougher schedule, obviously, and, and other and other factors, and not having Jalen Daniels. But I I think that could be the case where it's possible that you know if this KU team played last year's KU team, I think this KU team would win by possibly double digits. I mean, they're way better on defense. They you know they've got a lot of talent, obviously, still. So, uh, but at the same time, KU could still finish six and six or seven, by, right? Which would feel I think a bit disappointing for a lot of KU fans. But to my big thing has always been. If you just get to a bowl, I don't really care. Like six, yeah. seven, five, eight, and four, it's all the same. Just get to a bowl and I'll be happy. I'll have a good time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did want to say a couple things about the Oklahoma State game because number one, yeah, I was at the game and I wanted to jump off a bridge. It was terrible. Uh, it was really bad. But it was actually kind of an interesting dichotomy because I walked out of the stadium like just really pissed off, like just really angry. And then I started thinking like, that was actually kind of a cool feeling because normally you walk out of the stadium after a KU game and you're just like defeated. Just yeah. totally dejected. And so yeah. it's like the fact that I had this anger that was like, man, could have had it and didn't get it uh, was kind of interesting. But yeah, I think uh, Lance Leipold has also said that he likes, he prefers to have bye weeks like towards the middle of the season. He said, you see a lot of teams actually have their bye weeks, you know, after like their third game or before conference play or whatever. And Lance has said that he prefers it more in the middle of the season, probably for this reason, right? I mean, yeah. it seemed like it came at just the right time for KU, a chance to sort of mentally reset, get everybody healthy and get ready for this this final push. Uh, but with the Oklahoma game, yeah, I, I mean, even in a loss, if they're, if it's a competitive game, I don't think I'll view the rest of the season that much differently. I mean, Texas Tech stinks. I mean, those yeah. guys stink. Hey, yeah. your chance to win at home against them. Iowa State at Ames is concerning to me, but we'll, we'll see. You got K-State, obviously, and then Cincinnati. So I think you should still be able to win two out of those last four games. Which would put you at seven and five if you lose Oklahoma, right? Mm-hmm. Even though it's not flashy, it's not nine and three, it's not, you know, a massive increase, but you already had a massive increase last year from the year before. So you can't just be yeah. expecting to have that every year. Uh so I think we'll see. Yeah, I think I think seven definitely just be just flat out looking at that from a like you said, this team is better than last year's team. And so it would kind of be deflating to just have the exact same year as last year. But like you said, in 15 years, six versus seven wins means absolutely nothing. It's get to a goal or get to a bowl, continue the progress, keep things going. And and yeah, I mean, like 
I brought the question up of, oh, if they lay an egg this weekend. But you bring up a really good point. It's probably not fair to make this game the judge, like the judging point on the rest of the season because they're playing a top 10 team that's undefeated that, yeah. like you said, has a chance of making a college football playoff. Um, but it just, God, that Oklahoma State game is one that's just going to eat at you for a while, especially. I mean, even if this season goes like awesome, like a mat, like that Oklahoma State game is almost going to hurt more if we win Saturday, or even if we lose Saturday and then win three of the last four. You're, I don't know. It, yeah, it still gets to the yeah. point it's seven that or six or seven that much different than eight. I don't know, but it just yeah, that game was so deflating, and it it feels like we've at least got to come out and just play good football. Doesn't mean you got to win, but I trust the team to do that. Um, and I think, like you said, I think Lance, after a bye week, um, will be prepared. We'll be ready to go. And I'm very the cold weather thing. Um, I'm talking. I a b planted <laughs> that in my brain this morning, and now it's all I can think about. Like, feels like a good recipe to pull off pull off an upset. Um, all right. So tell me this: what like? If we're sitting here next week having an episode, what do you think happens that leads KU to winning? Is it, it does it is it gonna need to be a massive running game? Is it gonna need to be a Jason Bean first half, you know, like he played against Oklahoma State, but all game? Like what do you think is the main thing that would lead KU to a win Saturday? Yeah, so going back to what I was mentioning about KU playing at home. I think the biggest thing here is going to be taking advantage of Oklahoma's mistakes in terms of turnovers. KU at home has been really, really good in forcing turnovers and not turning it over. Uh, but it just goes beyond that, right? Uh, you go back to the game last year against Oklahoma. If you remember, KU was either down seven or it might the game might have been tied and Dylan Gabriel fumbled and KU went three and out. And then it was like bow race from there. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to come down to forcing turnovers, but also capitalizing on them and, and scoring off of them if you're KU. And yeah, like I said, I think you need Jason Bean to play well. I don't think he needs to play at a superstar level or be insane, but you need him to play pretty well. Uh, I, I would like to see KU focus more on the ground game. They, you know, Oklahoma State really, really tried to take it away, and they did do a pretty good job uh, overall. Devin Neal still average five yards per carry in the game, though. By the way, <laughs> yeah, I would assume that Oklahoma is going to have a similar strategy to try to, to limit KU's ground game. But I think Oklahoma's defensive front is is a little bit more vulnerable, maybe than Oklahoma State, and KU might have a chance to to get some more push there. Uh, so it, the big thing for me, uh, another point that I feel very strongly about about this game, and I felt the same way about Oklahoma State, and it came back to bite KU in the ass. So Lance, if you are listening, I'm telling you right now. Sure he is. You win the coin toss. Lance, if you win the coin toss, take the damn ball first. Take the ball first. Yeah, I said the same thing about the Oklahoma State game, and sure as shit, it's 14-0. Okay? Yeah. Lance, yeah. I'm begging you. Take the ball first. Go down and score. Everyone's going to be happy. You build the momentum early in the game. I, I think that's the right decision here to, to, to get off on the right foot and really set the tone for the game because if you have to play on the back foot or play from behind, especially early, that's just going to put more pressure on Jason Bean and it's going to probably limit your playbook a little bit. And look what happened last year. KU got into a track with Oklahoma and they couldn't compete. Oklahoma event ran away with it, right? Yeah. When you go back to 2021 in the game where KU almost had a chance to win, it was the complete opposite. They limited the number of possessions. They, they, they you know shortened the game a bit. Yeah. I think that's probably the right way to go is especially with Jason B is utilize your utilize your star running backs, Devin Neal and Daniel Hyshaw. You know, if you want to believe that Devin Neal and Daniel Hyshaw are two of the or you know, is maybe one of the top running back duos in the entire country, this is a game where you have a chance to prove this is a, this yeah. is a game where you have a chance to go out and, you know, flex your muscles a little bit and prove that uh, you have one of the top running back tandems in the country. So I would like to see them utilize that more. I'd be curious to see what the if they utilize any sort of option game with Jason Bean. His option game is not as good as Jalen Daniels, but might still see some of it. Uh, and then you know, take your shots. The thing about the thing about Jason Bean is he's going to sling. He's going to sling downfield. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. so you know, you'll have probably some chances to do that as well. But and then on the defensive side, I think the health is going to be beneficial for KU, especially up front. They seem a lot healthier than they were against Oklahoma State. But again, I think you just got to find a way to not let Oklahoma's tempo get rolling. Uh, you know, so that means being really stout on first down because that's where Oklahoma can really get you. You know, if, if they're getting four or five, six yards on first down, then they just go, 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 go. Uh, and again, 
Ryan Moreland has shown that he is not the best at handling tempo. So, and Oklahoma goes very, very quick. It's terrifying to hear. And your point yeah. about like if they get that, if they get the ball right out of the gates and just run it, you know, just do a classic Dylan Gabriel OU drive where it's just our defense has no shot. I can already just feel the energy in the booth going away. Everyone's going to be looking around like, oh. I don't know if it's not seven nothing, seven nothing Oklahoma with like twelve thirty left in the first quarter. It's gonna feel disastrous. Yeah. So I think you take the ball first and set the tone. If you're if I'm if I'm if I'm Lance. I love it. All right. Let's let's uh let's talk DraftKings real quick. Uh NBA fans, the wait is over. Basketball is back and DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA is celebrating with an unbeatable offer. New customers can score two hundred dollars instantly in bonus bets for throwing down $5 on the NBA. Win or lose, it doesn't matter. You start the season with an instant dub and with DraftKings parlays, everyone gets a shot at even bigger basketball wins. String together multiple bets from the same game or build your parlay across multiple games for a shot at making your payday even sweeter. Basketball is more fun when you're in on the action. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use code KCSN. New customers can get $200 in bonus bets instantly for betting just $5 only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code KCSN. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. Please play responsibly on behalf of Boot Hill Casino Resort in Kansas. 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in O and T bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See sportsbook.draftkings.com slash basketball terms for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. We'll take a quick break and we will be right back. Thanks for listening to KC Sports Network. Make sure you download our new app. Find it on the App Store or Google Play. Just search KC Sports Network. All right, I got a couple more things, and then we can we can make this a quick one and, and get out of here. But um, I guess first thing we mentioned crowds sold out. Uh, Kenny Logan was tweeting, you know, why is this game not sold out? Which to me, if I'm a football player, I totally get it. That's fair. Um, but what are our thoughts? I mean, game day, the atmosphere, the crowd that showed up was absolutely insane. We won't even touch that, but. Are you feeling good about the crowd that'll show up to Big Noon? Or could it be a situation where it's like, now that it's cold, I mean, KU has an exhibition game on Sunday in basketball. Like, I don't know. Is there any worry that maybe we don't have this huge turnout at Big Noon like we did with game day? Or do you fully expect it to still be in an electric atmosphere like it was last year? Yeah, I actually was just talking about this on on Rock Talk Sports Talk earlier today, and the consensus was, you know, if you think about, or I'll just ask you, Ryan, how many people do you think were at game day last year? Rough estimate. 5,000, 6,000? Yeah, I was going to say at least 5,000. 5, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think Big Noon, it's not as big of a brand. It's not as well known, not as popular. I think if you say 60% of the number of people that went to game day will show up for Big Noon. So that gets you to a decent sized crowd. I mean, if, if 3,000 people are out there, I think that's, that's probably yeah. pretty good. Yeah. Uh, so I think it'll be, I don't know. I think the atmosphere will be definitely not as good as game day because it's not as big of a deal, but I expect there'd still be some KU fans out there, uh, enjoying themselves and the weather could certainly impact it as well. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I, th- I think it'll still be a decent crowd. Like I'm expecting it's still a, a pretty solid crowd. And, you know, I, I see nothing drives me more crazy than people on Twitter who are like, Oh, well, Oklahoma fans, I'm sure contributed to the sellout. Like nobody, literally, no one gives a fuck. I'm yeah. sure. No one cares if it's a sellout. Who cares? Yeah, uh, it's just ridiculous. Road teams have fans too that travel to other stadiums. It's a very common thing in sports. But yeah, yeah, I mean, it. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's the game day last year felt like almost like a. I don't even know how to describe it. It almost felt like a parade, like a championship parade that you have after you win a title. But it was more of like a championship parade of being done with the old era of Kansas football. Like, I think that was kind of the moment where all fans came together. We're like, we made it. This is, we are officially here. We are legit. 
I'm I'm kind of nervous. I mean, it's awesome big news coming, and I think we'll we'll have people there. We'll it'll be fine. Yeah. But I also just like don't. I'm like almost nervous of like the jokes on Twitter, of like, oh look at Kansas, like oh, already basketball season. I don't know. So I just I didn't know what it. I didn't know how other people were feeling about it because I don't really watch Big Noon. Clearly, I can't even remember yeah. the name. And uh, there's no Pat McAfee effect. I don't know. We'll see. But either way, it's absolutely, absolutely awesome that it's happening. Um, so let's wrap this up with this. Uh, I want to hear your official prediction. You can do spread. You can do who you think wins outright. You can do exact score if you want, but just based on what you, I mean, you've been talking about this game probably all week. You've probably heard yeah. a lot about it. Where do you think this game finishes up at come Saturday at like what? Three o'clock. Yeah, dude. I mean, I, I've been going back and forth. I think uh, over the course of the week, um, you mentioned how you're feeling over the course of the week. Do you remember the 30 for 30? Um, oh gosh, Catholics versus convicts. Yeah. It was with uh, Lou Holtz and, and uh, Miami. There's a quote of there from Lou Holtz where he's like telling his team and he's like, on Monday, you're the worst team ever. You can't beat anybody. On Tuesday, like you might have a chance. On Wednesday, you're like kind of decent. On Thursday, okay, you're really good. And on Friday, you're going to win the national championship. That's kind of how I've been feeling about this game, actually. Like earlier in the week, I was like, oh, dude, fuck. Like this is going to be brutal. But over the course of the week, I've, I've steadily been feeling a little, a little bit more confident. And so right now, I, I feel fairly confident that KU is going to keep it close and keep it a competitive game. I I have a really hard time picking them though. I think Oklahoma's offense is just a little bit too explosive, uh, and we have, we haven't really touched on the defense. Oklahoma's defense has been significantly improved from last season than where uh, from where they were last season uh, in their second year under Brent Venables, and so I guess we'll see how that plays out against Kansas. Uh, I do think KU is going to have some stuff schemed up, and I do think that KU is going to have some success on offense as well. Uh, but I'm going to go my final prediction. Oklahoma 34, Kansas 28. That's my final prediction. Uh, I, I think I think KU's going to keep it close. I think they're going to be battling, but I'm just not 100% sure if they're going to have the juice towards the end of the game to really follow through and, and finish it off. You know, like, like I was touching on earlier with, with Jason Bean, like, and listen, I love, you won't meet a bigger Jason Bean fan than me. Like, I love that. Awesome. Uh, he's so much fun, uh, and it's really great that KU got him back this season because who knows where, the, where they'd be without him. Yeah. With Jalen Daniels injuries, but I just, I just don't know if he has the juice, man. I don't know if he has it late in the game to go down and, and possibly win it for KU. So that's my biggest concern, and that's why I think I'm going to lead Oklahoma in a close game. But I, I expect it to be competitive. I expect Kansas to be in it, and uh, I think uh, I just think Oklahoma might pull away a little bit towards the end and, and get the win. Yep, fair. Um, so I don't know if you remember, but beginning of the season. Me, A, B, B turn. We did an episode where we talked about, like, I think best case scenario, worst case scenario. Me and A, B yelled at each other. It was, yep. we talked about bold predictions. My bold prediction was that KU would beat OU. Now, part of that prediction was me calling Venables fraud and talking about how he wasn't even going to make it to the SEC with OU. So that's a tough look, but I'm not going to stray away from my prediction. Like you said, I love that quote because that's me every week. By Friday, the Hawks are back in contention for the college football playoff. Here we are on Thursday, and I at least, I just, I, I keep joking about the cold weather, but I think it gives us a shot. I think we can win the game on the ground with Devin Neal. Ugly it up a little bit. I'm not talking like a 14 to 10 game, but, you know, maybe maybe we sneak out, a, I'm going to predict, a 21, no, I'm going to go 24-21. Hawks and an absolute there we go just I gotta stick with my original prediction I'd feel so dumb if I predicted that in the first episode about football this season he knocked out <laughs> and like you said Jason Bean he he could have his moments he we've seen flashes where he looks just as good as Jalen Daniels like you said it's just gonna come down to can he make the big plays when it matters can he make the right decision when it matters and I just I think I'm also getting slightly tricked a little bit by the UCF game because OU just looked horrible. Um, yeah. And I'm hoping maybe maybe the beginning of their season was kind of a, you know, not a fluke, but a little, little outlandish compared to where they truly are talent level. So I'm hoping we start to see them drop down a little bit and maybe we can steal a win in that process. So that's what I'll go with. 
Yeah, I will say, I think uh, if you look at Oklahoma's season, it's it's obvious that they were building towards the Texas game. So after the Texas game, how long is it going to take them to sort of recharge that emotional energy they probably expended in that game? Like, you know, are, are we, I, we think they're going to get up, but are they going to get up to that level to be able to beat Kansas? I don't know. Because if you don't show up at the booth, man, yeah, you're gonna be waving the wheat. Yeah, it'll get you. It'll get you. Um, and also, if AB was, does OU play Oklahoma State next week? No, they play Oklahoma State the week after, I believe. Oh, well, I was going to try and sneak in an AB reference about look ahead and all that, but I think we covered. Oh no, um, wait, they do play Oklahoma. They do play Oklahoma State next week. There we go. Look there ahead. Go. Look ahead, and Oklahoma State's all yeah, of a sudden. There we go. Oklahoma State. By the way, can we just touch on this real quick? Is Oklahoma State sneaky good? I think there's. I think they could be sneaky good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look at their schedule. They're going to have a chance to – They, I mean, they might be in the Big 12 Championship. I don't know. I know. I mean, it's you take away that game. game where they got smoked by whoever that awful team was. Or, I don't even uh, know. South Alabama. South Alabama. You take that game out, they're having just a decent – I mean, they're having a solid season, a typical Oklahoma yeah. State season. So, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but, no, it, it's going to be a fun, fun day either way. It's incredible that we are here in late October – talking about KU playing against a top 10 team. And I don't think any of us would truly be that shocked if they found a way to win. So, uh, feels good. Any, any last thoughts before we, before we head out for the night? I know I picked against Kansas, but I will obviously be, uh, cheering on the Hawks very much. So, and if they win, I hope to see Urban Meyer in the boom. That's all I'll say. That is, that is, I think win or lose. Urban Meyer is probably going to be he's, he's probably going to be there regardless. That's a good he's point. He's probably going to be there Friday night. So <laughs> that is a hammer that. If you're going to make any pick, hammer Urban Meyer head into the boom room. But all right, that is it. That's all we got for this week. Thank you, Nick, for for stepping in and filling in for B-Turn and AB. This was good. And uh, we'll see you all back here next week. Rock Chalk.